Let's start, and uh, when others come in, they can always join us. Uh, on behalf of the Center for Pacific Island Studies and the uh, Institute of Sustainability and Resilience at UH Manoa, I'd like to take the opportunity to welcome all of you uh, to this series, Pacific Resilience. Uh, we've had a few already, and we have one today, and we continue uh, until the end of the semester. So welcome to all of you and thank you so much for joining us uh, for this session today. What we we, today we have Seth Quintus, uh, who will be giving a talk on the deep time construction of Polynesian islands, methods of application and resilience. Seth is an assistant professor in the anthropology department here at UH Manoa, and he's been there since 2006 after completing his PhD from the University of Auckland in New Zealand. Uh, his research interests include historical ecology and political economy of Oceania, especially in Samoa and Hawaii. Thank you so much, Seth, for giving up your busy time to be uh, part of this and to uh, talk story with us today. But before I... Uh, give the floor to Seth, uh, two reminders, housekeeping reminders. The first is that this session is recorded, uh, but it only records the speaker and the moderators. Uh, and uh, second, at the end of uh, Seth's talk, if you have questions, or even during the talk, if you have questions, please put it in the Q&A uh, folder, and then we'll go and have a look at it, not in the chat folder. Uh, at the end of the session or at the end of Seth's talk, we'll have a look at it uh, and we'll go through your questions. Again, thank you so much, Seth, and I'll give you the floor. All right, thank you very much. Uh, I'm very happy to be here, happy to talk about archeology span and I'll, I'll try to leave quite a bit of time for questions at the end so we can talk a little bit more about archeology. span what I want to talk about today is how islands become constructed and the ways that we can use both archaeology and the past to inform the contemporary situation, to inform ideas around adaptation, resiliency, and to some extent sustainability in contemporary times. There's a tendency to see both the past and archaeology as somewhat divorced from the present especially divorce from uh, solving contemporary problems. Certainly, most people recognize how archaeology in the past contribute to cultural heritage. And I'm sure many of you are aware of case studies about the past that tell us what not to do. And those are often termed examples of collapse. But archaeology provides so much more. The past provides so much more. We're seeing this to some extent in some areas of research. Fisheries research, for instance, uses archaeological data all the time to create baselines that are more empirical and more realistic end goals for conservation and restoration because archaeological data spans millennia, not decades or centuries uh, that you might get with other kinds of disciplines. So there, uh, there's a great utility in having that time span. Archaeology can be used for more things as well. We often use archaeology to create visions of alternative futures. There's a great deal of information that's embedded within the archaeological record. 
the archaeological record it includes cultural responses that extend back from when our species first emerged some 200,000 years ago. There's more cultural responses that occurred in that past than there is presently in our own world today. So we can use the archaeological record to mine that ecological knowledge that might help us understand how we might adapt and stay resilient to dynamic environments that we experience. Part of that, it, part of that resilience and adaptation involves the construction of environments. And that's really what I'm going to talk about today. I use this figure quite a bit when I talk about the construction of the environment, because these are two of the most constructed islands in Polynesia, Ofu and Olesenga in the Manua group of American Samoa. Each of these little black spots in the, on these islands represents an artificial terrace. Terracing on Olisenga extends over about 68% of the island. And so it speaks really to that method of adaptation. Past peoples and even peoples today don't passively adapt to their environment. They actively construct an environment that will suit their needs. We've been doing this, as I mentioned, for over 200,000 years. Ever since our species emerged, we've started to modify the environment incrementally to suit our needs. While this has been appreciated for quite some time, and we've seen this idea of pristine wilderness areas in the Americas, uh, especially in the Amazon, revised uh, in such a way to privilege ideas of domesticated landscapes. The true scale and nature of this modification is only recently uh, been documented. And that documented, documentation of the true scale and nature of this modification owes a lot to recent methodological advances, principally remote sensing. Remote sensing in archaeology has been revolutionary, especially the application of LIDAR data sets. Is, and that's what you're seeing right here. LiDAR datasets allow us to create high resolution topographic images, digital elevation models from which we can really see physical modifications to the environment. This is best known from the Mayan lowlands, so in Mesoamerica, as well as Southeast Asia. And what this demonstrates is that our knowledge of past land use has been very minimal. It's only in the last 10 years, for instance, that we've started to rethink what Mayan cities used to look like. We all have images of Mayan cities that include these central compounds that you can see here, the large structures at the center of these cities. But a more important component of a Mayan city are, is everything outside of that central compound that extends for square kilometers. In fact, people have questioned whether there's even such thing of, as rural Mayans. It seems that each city center extends into each other. What we see from this image of a Mayan city is that these cities are integrated. They're integrated agricultural landscapes and urban landscapes. They're practicing agriculture in the form of agroforestry, but also more intensive forms of agriculture using terracing right along with their houses. Archaeologists have used this information from both the Mayan lowlands here, but also from Southeast Asia, where you see a very similar pattern, to ask whether we should re-envision cities. And this is another contribution of archaeology, how we can use these templates or models of what cities used to look like and, if we're, and see if we're able to apply that to contemporary days. We use two concepts pretty frequently to talk about large scale modifications to the landscape in archeology. span So the first is landscape domestication. Landscape domestication are all the practices, often incremental practices that are relatively local in scale that eventually lead to a productive, physically patterned environment. 
the, the process of landscape domestication includes day-to-day -day activities, things like weeding, things like pruning, replacing one tree with another tree. As those things incrementally accumulate over generations upon generations, that results in entire landscapes that are modified by human beings. This process is best typified by the Amazon basin. In Amazonia, there's increasing recognition that much of the forest structure, especially close to riverbanks, is the product of human engineering, is the product of human modification, and the legacies of previous land use. Instead of seeing the Amazon as pristine, as something that's natural, as wilderness, archaeologists, anthropologists, and other environmental science see the Amazon as a human constructed environment that is the product of tens of thousands of years of engineering. The second concept we frequently use is niche construction. Niche construction is the process by which organisms affect their own evolutionary trajectory. Landscape domestication and niche construction are related concepts. Landscape domestication can lead to niche construction or is a component of niche construction. Niche construction allows us to alleviate selective pressures that might exist in our environment. And as we alleviate those selective pressures, we're able to undertake activities that we wouldn't be able to undertake otherwise. But as we alleviate or reduce the impacts of certain selective pressures, we often create other selective pressures. For every, every time we solve a problem, there's several consequences that come out of that solving of the problem. So what we see in the archaeological record is kind of a constant back and forth, a recursive relationship between humans and their environment as humans change their environment and as humans respond to that, that environment that they changed. These processes are probably nowhere clearer than in Oceania. Oceania, at least near Oceania, was settled before 40,000 years ago, probably closer to 50,000 years ago, at least in New Guinea. And very early on, shortly after the settlement of near Oceania, you start to see the construction of the environment, the modification of the environment. Burning of vegetation, both to induce the growth of more, more useful plants, make hunting easier, incrementally over generations started to transform that environment in near Oceania. Eventually, about 3,000 years ago, people start to move out further into Oceania, into the, the place that we call remote Oceania, or the region we refer to as remote Oceania, into Vanuatu, New Caledonia, Fiji, Tonga, Samoa. And just like what we see in near Oceania, people very quickly start to engineer, modify their environments to suit their needs. Part of that process of moving into these different areas, moving further and further, further out into Oceania is the, the transportation of the landscape. The transported landscape is an idea that's been around for, for decades, but it's a key to understanding both resiliency and sustainability as these islands are settled. The transportation of landscape refers to the carrying or transportation of fauna and flora, plants and animals, as people move further and further out. Most of the domesticates that make their way into these further remote areas of Oceania were originally domesticated in that New Guinea area. Carrying out those domesticates, taro, breadfruit, and other crops enables sur survival in ecosystems that become a little bit more depopulate as you move further and further east. In addition to those goods, those plants and animals that people bring out into Oceania, they're also bringing ideas. They're bringing ideas about what the environment should look like. They're bringing ideas about how the environment should function. And those ideas become key elements of landscape construction, landscape domestication as well. <laughs>
Eventually, people start, after they reach the end of the Samoan archipelago about 2,600 years ago, they, there's a, another pause in settlement. And then eventually they start moving out into East Polynesia. East Polynesia is settled about 1,000 years ago with the apexes of the Polynesian Triangle, especially New Zealand and Rapa Nui, settled by at least 1,200 AD or so. The variability, the variability and the timing of settlement throughout Oceania speaks to different socio-ecological histories. There's a great deal of cultural and ecological variation throughout the region. And in each area, there is a process of landscape domestication and landscape construction. You could literally talk about any island in the Pacific and you'd find evidence of that construction activity because it's so essential to adaptation and resilience in these locations. I'm going to focus on my own research in Polynesia, principally Samoa and Hawaii, to give you a sense of, of what these processes look like. So the first thing that we need to do is appreciate what construction actually looks like, what constructed environments look like in the past. Our views of construction are very much contemporary for many of us. When we think about construction, we think of buildings. We think of synthetic materials, and usually we think of it in somewhat of a negative light. Construction in the past and environmental construction was uh, pretty different. Obviously, you don't have those synthetic materials you can use for construction activity. So most landscape domestication, landscape construction utilizes things like earthen and stone architecture, earthen and stone infrastructure. But we're also talking about geomorphological changes brought on by human land use and vegetation replacement. That's one of the key areas, key reasons for survival. One of my favorite examples of this is the island of Futuna. So this, this image is courtesy of one of my colleagues, Patrick Kirch, uh, in the Department of Anthropology, who conducted research in, on the island of Futuna in the 1970s. But it shows really well the extent of landscape construction. Here you have on the coast the village. That village includes a lot of arboreal crops. Trees are, are, are really interspersed around all of those buildings. Those trees are things that are reforested following the elimination of the, these lowland forests. And this is something we see over and over again as people move out into Polynesia it, throughout the Pacific is reforestation. They begin to deforestate much of the island and reforest that same island, reforest that island with economic trees. We also see geomorphological changes brought on by human land use that have fundamental impacts on future decision making. What you'll see right here just inland of the modern day village are taro pond fields. Those pond fields are pretty indicative of Polynesia and Oceania more generally. But in many places, those pond fields were only possible because of the erosion that occurred after people deforested slopes in the hill slopes surrounding these valleys. What the erosion of sediments from those hill slopes did was infill those valleys. Those valleys used to be relatively marshy. Some of them were much more open to the ocean. And in conjunction with natural more geomorphological changes, especially the progradation of the shoreline in these spaces and terrigenous infilling that's caused by erosion of these hill slopes, you create a space that's more conducive to taro pond fields, to taro irrigation. And it's only after this pro process of infilling occurs that we see people focusing on those ba valley bottoms as real, uh, as landscapes that can be productive. And then even inland of that, we start to see more modified forests. We start to see vegetation replacement. And in some islands, infrastructural developments that, that really augment where people can live and where people can grow crops. And that's part of what you're seeing in these two lower images down here. This image on the left is of a terrace in Samoa. Uh, terraces are very hard to photograph. Um, they are relatively large. So th this one in particular is about 150 square meters and they occur in heavily forested environments. Um, what you're seeing in this photograph is just the retaining wall of this terrace. That retaining wall is about a meter and a half tall. 
So people are moving earth, constructing, reconstructing, augmenting slopes to create additional habitation space as populations grow and cre create more cultivatable space as populations grow as well. On the right, you're seeing more classic infrastructure of Hawaii. Um, these are termed kui'ivi. They're earthen embankments. Their primary function is probably as boundaries of plots, but they have a lot of agronomic functions as well. They reduce wind to such an extent that they retain soil moisture. So they're alleviating a selective pressure within the environment that we associate with leeward areas of high islands. So one of the questions that we need to address pretty quickly is how much construction are we actually talking about? What's the scale of the construction? Conventionally, construction was thought to be relatively limited. Um, I'm sure many of you have heard population estimates that uh, are pretty minimal, but with recent advances in uh, archaeological techniques, we're starting to re rethink that scale of modification, rethink the scale of populations throughout the, the region. These are just two examples of how LIDAR has changed our understanding of the scale of construction on these islands. On the left, you'll see Olasenga Island, which I mentioned before. It's, part of, it's in American Samoa, uh, the Manua group in American Samoa. This is one of the most constructed islands I've ever seen. Uh, each individual terrace, again, is one of those black dots or black dimples across the landscape. It makes the interior of the island look kind of like a golf ball. 68% of that interior landscape is terraced, has been modified, has, has been constructed. In addition to the physical construction, in addition to the geomorphological construction you're seeing here, there's substantial changes to the vegetation as well that mimic, that match the extent of that, that terraced construction. On the right, you're seeing the extent of wall Olefa Valley in, uh, on the island of Upolu in the independent state of Samoa. This construction, these archaeological remains are nearly continuous from the coastline until about 12 kilometers inland. Interspersed among these walls and ditches is evidence of habitation. So what this is a remnant of is an incredibly dispersed settlement zone that integrated residential activity with agricultural, uh, agricultural landscapes that again, fundamentally shaped present day vegetation and ecosystem functions. All of this construction activity that we see in several islands is directional. They're doing it again to alleviate selective pressures, to create landscapes that are far more productive for people than what they experienced when they initially got to these places. Often what, what, what communities would do is target infrastructure to improve land, or target infrastructure to take advantage of natural variations and safe soil fertility. So I'll show a couple examples of how this occurred. So this, this example that you're seeing right now is in the Ka'u district of the Big Island. Uh, it's in the Kahuku, um, a part of Volcanoes National Park. It's where I've done a little bit of research. And what we were interested in during this project is understanding why people made the decision to build infrastructure, build these soil embankments that serve as boundaries of agricultural plots, but also serve agronomic functions to retain soil moisture in the areas that they, they, they did build it. And you can see this agricultural infrastructure uh, on, on these slides right here. So it's this lighter area and then the, it's mapped out in these, these green lines as well. And we wanted to understand the relationship between that agri the agricultural infrastructure and the depth of soil. And what we found was a really nice correlation that people were locally targeting really shallow soils to build agricultural infrastructure. 
they weren't targeting deeper soils. You don't see agricultural infrastructure, at least in this particular location, associated with those deeper soils. And it has a lot to do with soil moisture. The retention of soil moisture is a lot more difficult in shallow soils relative to deeper soils. So people were actively locating those areas that they needed to improve, alleviating the selective pressure that would have restricted cultivation by investing in this local infrastructure. And we see this across the Big Island, at least in the leeward areas of the Big Island. Local adaptations that are probably made by smallholder farmers to local levels of environmental variability that increase the productivity of the environment, increase yields, yield predictability, and probably um, just yields in general. In, on over a year-to-year -year basis by alleviating the selective pressures that would have restricted those yields. And looking at more of the functionality of these embankments, you're seeing some data on soil moisture and what, what the effect that these embankments, these Kua EV have on the retention of soil moisture at, in, within these plots themselves. So on the windward side of these, these Kua EV, we generally have more depressed soil moisture levels than on the leeward sides of these Kuiivi, which just tells us again that what these, these embankments are doing is retaining that soil moisture. The retention of soil moisture is incredibly important within these leeward zones that depend on rain-fed agriculture. And so again, you see that local adaptation, the use of infrastructure to alleviate a lot of these selective pressures that would have reduced agricultural productivity. You also see the targeting of infrastructure in naturally fertile areas. And this is some of my research in Samoa. What we were interested in is why people were building infrastructure where they were building it, why people were building terraces in particular where they were building it. And what we're seeing is that people were targeting uh, naturally fertile areas. So one of the things that you'll see here is the relationship between the size of terracing and percent base saturation. Percent base saturation is one metric that you can use to, to measure soil fertility. And we see a correlation between these, these two variables. Larger terraces on average are built in places of higher base, percent base saturation um, than smaller terraces. The one difference right here is when you get above 81% base saturation, um, there's some local changes that happen to the environment that probably explain that. There's a landslide that occurs in that area that exposes more uh, recent lava flows to, to erosion, creating that really fertile soil, but it's really steep. So it probably limited um, the actual construction of infrastructure. What this image right here on the right, the upper right is showing is just the positioning of all of this infrastructure with on, on one geological substrate. It looks like people were able to gain knowledge of the surrounding ecological, uh, the underlying geological fertility, and we're targeting that particular fertility. The largest ter terraces that are often associated with habitation, residence, and often status residential areas, so people of higher status, chiefly status, would live in these locations, are located near the center of the substrate. Decreases in terrace size are associated with decreases in productivity as you get closer and closer to the edges of that substrate. Again, identifying and marking the edges of fertility identifying and marking those areas of the landscape that are more con most conducive to your particular lifestyle. The third case study involves Ofu and Olasanga that I mentioned before, the two islands in the Manua group that are heavily constructed. What we've been able to do is, because we have LIDAR data for both of these islands and the entirety of both islands, is really map the extent of the high density areas of the archeological record. And so that's what you're seeing outlined in black. 
the high density archaeological record, terracing in particular, are located within the confines of these black polygons. What you're also seeing on this slide are different, different uh, kinds of forest structure. So the darker gray are economic forest, things like coconut, breadfruit, Tahitian chestnut. The lighter gray is secondary growth forest. What this correlation helps us to understand is how the, the nature of these settlements, how people constructed their environments. And again, what we see is an integrated production system and residential system on these two islands. We see a very significant correlation between the highest density areas of settlement and economic forests. So what it looks like is people were really investing in agro, agroforestry right around their houses. And upslope of their houses, represented by the secondary forest, is probably shifting cultivation zones. So people were investing in multiple kinds of subsistence, multiple kinds of agricultural technologies to contribute to these relatively large constructed environments on these two islands. These two islands are also important because they make us recognize that populations in the past, in some cases, were far larger on these islands than what we see today. On each island, Ofu and Olasenga, there's a present day contemporary population of about two or 300 people. Based on the number of terraces that we have on these two islands, so just based on a count of the houses and how many people would have lived in these houses in the past, our best estimates for how many people lived on each island in the past was between 1,000 and 1,500. So in total, between the two islands, we might be talking about a population as big as 3,000 people that was supported relatively self-sufficiently. And one of the keys to the supporting that large of a population on these small islands was agroforestry. By planting economic trees amongst residential space, you're able to utilize that space much more efficiently. Some kinds of economic trees are also incredibly productive. Breadfruit in particular is an incredibly productive food resource that people took advantage of in the, pa in the past, not just on these two islands, but on other islands as well. It also looks like small islands were and survival on small islands required great deals of construction. While we have a lot of good data on the geomorphological construction of Olfu and Olasenga, we have better data on the vegetative construction of other small islands within the Pacific. The island of Tikapia, for instance, is a very good example of this. The island of Tikapia, which is kind of the poster child of oceanic sustainability today, is only sustainable because people replaced 95% of the vegetation on that island. They replaced 95% of the native vegetation with economic plants. They domesticated their landscape to produce something that was far more productive than what they encountered as they got to these places, as they settled these islands. And it was agroforestry, at least in these small islands, that fueled a lot of that resiliency, sustainability of these relatively high populations. It was that alleviation, essentially, of small land area by investments in agroforestry that enabled this adaptation. It's important to recognize, though, that the changes that we make to the environment have ramifications. The changes that we make to the environment have consequences further down the road that are often unforeseen when we make the changes we do to the environment. Investments in agroforestry, at least in Samoa and Tikapia, create vulnerabilities in the system. This image 
is of the aftermath of the 1915 hurricane in Manua. This is the island of Ta'u on which I work quite a bit. It's about nine kilometers away from Ofu and Olesanga. And images of Ofu and Olesanga look a lot like this. For a population dependent on agroforestry, this is devastating. Records from 1915 indicate that about 100% of the banana crop was gone. Some 75% of the breadfruit crop was devastated as well. And it takes about five years for breadfruit trees to start producing again if they have to be grown from, from the bottom up. So anytime that you make changes to the environment, anytime you create these productive environments, there's that chance that you become path dependent. People, as, they, as populations grew in places like Ofu and Olesenga, they became more and more and more dependent on that modified ecosystem. And in this particular case, they became more and more dependent on space saving and productive agroforestry systems, which created these vulnerabilities in the system. This played out in a couple of different ways. We know that it, it was very devastating in places like Tikapia, even though we think of Tikapia as being very sustainable and resilient because of their agroforestry systems today, they're very self-sufficient. In the early 1950s, hurricanes struck Tikapia and absolutely devastated the agricultural system. It led to significant societal conflict. It led to significant attempts at migration. So this is a key, this is a key element to how, what we need to think about as we pursue things like constructed environments. Sustainability is contingent. Sustainability is often a moving target. What might be sustainability, what might be sustainable at one time might not be sustainable at another time say 100, 200, 300 years down the road. This path dependency is something that needs to be avoided. And that's what we see in the archeological record, that when people, when communities become too dependent, become too rigid, it often creates the vulnerabilities that result in these somewhat devastating impacts and often completely devastating impacts. So where does this leave us? How can we use the archeological record? How can we use these ideas about the past in contemporary times? There's a couple things that I think of as particularly important. The first one is that the way things were practiced in the past, so cultural practices in the past, cultural structures in the past, provide models or templates that we can use to envision alternative futures. That includes things like agroforestry. There's no doubt that agroforestry was productive. There's no doubt that agroforestry was space saving. There's very solid research now demonstrating that if we revitalize agroforestry, we could produce quite a bit of our own food, say here in Hawaii. So using those models and templates about how to envision settlement space, how to envision agricultural techniques might be a useful way to create our own vision of some type of alternative future. This doesn't mean that we'd replicate what people in the past did. It's important to recognize that not only are agricultural practices and settlement practices um, done within an environmental context, they're also done within a social context as well. And our social context, our social systems are very different than the social systems of the past. What I call for, or what I suggest, is that we retool these kinds of techniques. We rethink about using these techniques. And one of the best ways that we can do that is the second thing that I think is important. For, the, for using the archeological record, using the past. And that's taking advantage of the legacies that we have still with us in our landscapes. 
the legacies of past land use have been inherited constantly over generations. And we continue to inherit these legacies, these modifications to the landscape that were made 2,000 years ago, 1,000 years ago. Some of these are in the form of infrastructure. So you're seeing two different forms of infrastructure. The picture on the upper right is the classic infrastructural earthen embankments, Kua Evi, that we find in leeward zones. These embankments covered hundreds of kilometers, square kilometers on the Big Island. The Leeward Kohala field system in Leeward Kohala covered about 60 square kilometers covered in this kind of infrastructure. The Kau field system might have been as big as about 300 square kilometers, comparable to the size of the Kona field system. There's incredible untapped potential and low-hanging fruit that can be revitalized to increase food sovereignty and food security in our state by just revitalizing some of these old, this old infrastructure this old infrastructure that still serves agronomic functions, that still reduces variation in soil moisture, that still increases soil moisture more generally. These kinds of techniques aren't restricted to Hawaii, and that's what you're seeing here on the left. This is a manavai from Rapa Nui. And I think Rapa Nui teaches us a very important lesson about human resilience and human adaptation. Most of us have been taught the image of Rapa Nui as a failure, as an island society that wasn't resilient, that couldn't adapt, and that ruined their environment. There's absolutely no question that human communities led to deforestation, along with introduced rats. But communities on Rapa Nui didn't collapse. Communities on Rapa Nui innovated. They were able to sustain their population even after deforesting their island by developing techniques like Manavai that, like Kuaivi in Hawaii, retain soil moisture and allow for cultivation in spaces that would otherwise not be cultivatable, would not be arable. And then this example down on the bottom here. Doesn't look like much, just looks like bananas growing. But this is really the, the ability to grow banana in this environment is due to past land use. Some of the most productive land on small islands today throughout the Pacific are those areas that border tailless slopes, those areas on the coast that border tailless slopes. And just like as valleys formed, valley bottoms formed by infilling from terrigenous sediments as humans started to deforest hill slopes. That deforestation of hill slopes and the eventual erosion of those hill slopes resulted in the deposition of that volcanic sediment on the coastline. Once it was on the coastline, it mixed with calcareous sediments that make up the coastline as well as debris and waste from previous human occupation. That soil that's created from the combination of those terrigenous sediments, the, the calcareous sediments, and the debris of previous land use are some of the most fertile on these islands today. In fact, in some islands, like Niwa Toputapu in the Tongan group, there's even folk taxonomic categories for this anthropogenic soil. Both this infrastructure, the vegetation, the relic vegetation that continues to propagate naturally that was a result of the creation of economic forests, and the geomorphological changes that results in the, the creation of opportunities, the creation of often fertile spaces, are things that we can use to envision new kinds of agricultural futures on these islands, using the product of past construction activities. So I'll end there. I, I appreciate your attention.
And I'd like to acknowledge a number of individuals. This, a lot of my own research is funded by NSF, Marsden, uh, New Zealand. Um, I, I get assistance and logistical support from the American Samoa Historic Preservation Office and the National Park Service. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Seth. We'll, um, we'll open it up for Q&A. So if you have any questions, uh, please um, uh, put it in the question and answer box and then we'll go from there. And, and thank you for this very informative uh, presentation. I learned uh, a great deal from it. Um, while we're waiting for others to ask questions, um, I have a, a comment and wonder if you could respond to it. Uh, and you're absolutely right that people throughout the Pacific as well as elsewhere in the world have always constructed their environment uh, to fit their particular situation. Uh, in the case of the Pacific Islands, you know, the past constructions and reconstructions of the environment were driven largely by domestic needs. And also where trade is involved, it's mostly trade between islands. Or if you look at, uh, you know, the case of Papua New Guinea, the cooler trade that went on in parts of Papua New Guinea. Uh, one of the challenges for Pacific Island places, and this is driven by ideas of economic development, is that a lot of these reconstructions of environments are driven by global economic needs and the need to meet the demands uh, of places like China or the US mm -hmm. or others. And we've seen it in the case of sandalwood trade here in Hawaii, as well as in other parts of the Pacific Islands. And I'm, I'm wondering, you know, we, we can learn a lot from mm -hmm. the archeological work that you and others have done, and they're really, really useful. Uh, in informing how we deal with things nowadays. I'm, I'm wondering, you know, how, if you have any comments on how the archeological evidence and what we can learn from it uh, can inform how we deal with the drivers of these environmental reconstructions nowadays. So how, say, archaeological rec the archaeological record or archaeological data can help us understand how people can adapt today in kind of a globalized world? Yeah, yeah that's, I think that's pretty, it's, it can be tricky. And one of the things I think you brought up is that trade is really important to this. Trade, I, I didn't mention it here, but trade and mobility was a really important component of survivability, sustainability, resilience uh, across the Pacific. So we tend to think of trade in economic terms, but in the past trade was very much, mobility was very much involved in redistributing resources that might not be available on some islands. Um, and those connections between places was really essential. Where we see those connections breaking down between islands is where we see abandonment of islands, where we see habitation settlements that just didn't work out for some reason is often where that gets cut off. So I think that can be very important. It's, a, it's a, both sovereignty at the local scale, so sovereignty at individual islands to, um, okay. to, to control their own environmental futures, because as you mentioned before, a lot of environmental futures in the Pacific Islands are being driven by, say, China, by the United States, by Australia, by New Zealand. So I think increased sovereignty to control actual environmental futures is key to this. And then second, recognizing mobility and recognizing exchange, recognizing sovereignty at more of the regional scale is a key to survivability and resilience as well. Recognizing that what's available, say, in Kiribati is not what's available, say, in Tuvalu or Tokelau. And recognizing that there's needs that Tokelau and communities have that they might be able to get from Samoa, which is a historic connection that we see uh, that developed after Tokelau was settled probably from Samoa. But I think it, it's that sovereignty that's key. If you can't, if, if you really can't control your environmental future, if you are, if your environmental construction, if your environmental land use is being driven principally by global demands, it's going to be very hard to create a self-sufficient system that makes you both food secure and food sovereign. 
I think you're muted. <laughs> Sorry, yeah. Uh, thank you, Seth. There are a couple of questions coming in, so let's go through each of them. So there's one that says, um, you know, Mahalo, and uh, are the examples in Samoa and the Big Island uh, reflected throughout Polynesia? Yeah, they are. This is a pretty common pattern that we see. One of the things that we see, I have a <clears throat> colleague, Matt Preble, um, who's at the University of Canterbury, uh, Canterbury in New Zealand. He's done some really interesting research to look at initial constructions of islands, usually in wetland areas, after mm -hmm. people first come to these places. And what he sees is a pretty recurrent pattern. People uh, create this template over and over again. And that's true with this economic reforestation. I have another colleague in the anthropology department, Barry Roulette, that's done some really interesting research to show that that pretty um, uh, consistent pattern of reforestation, attempting to create economic forests rather than native forests, uh, or economic forests by replacing the native forests after you arrive to these islands. Mm -hmm. Actually, research in the Marquesas is probably the best best case study of this to this uh, to this point. Mm. Uh, another question that we have, and, and again saying thank you to you, Seth, is um, the question is, is there a specific example of these land use practices being used to mitigate effects of climate change? Uh, uh, agroforestry is probably the best example of this right now. Um, and it's not just in the Pacific Islands. Uh, agroforestry is being used at a global scale to retain carbon. Uh, so the growth of, of trees is one, one, things that, one of the things that really does uh, uh, allow us to, to get carbon out of the atmosphere, um, so to speak. It's a carbon sink. Um, so that reforestation through agroforestry is seen as a, a land use practice can, that can really mitigate climate change. What agroforestry also does, and this is used on the island of Tikapia, is stabilized a lot, of, a lot of coastal zones as well. The root systems of some of these really large trees uh, enables that, that stabilization of the coastline itself to reduce the, the local impacts of coastal erosion. One of the things I think that people are really concerned about contempor in contemporary times also is runoff of terrigenous sediment onto reefs. Uh, that's where agroforestry can come into play as well, uh, because it is reducing that erosion to some extent. There is uh, an, another question. Uh, have you noticed that place names between Samoa and Hawaii are sometimes closely related, like Ta'u, Ka'u, Savai'i, Hawaii, Upolu, Upolu, Tokelau, Kolau, Kona, Tonga, do these perhaps point to categories uh, about the land or perhaps origins? It certainly could. I mean, that's certainly a possibility. I think certainly what it, it speaks to is, is this shared cultural heritage. Um, one of the things that, that makes working in Polynesia really great is that the area is settled relatively rapidly by groups of people that share cultural practices, that share cultural activities, that are culturally related. And that's very much evidenced by these shared place names. Um, it also probably speaks to, to some extent, uh, migration routes and things like that. But th this is an area that, that archaeologists and other anthropologists and other uh, in individuals working in Pacific Island studies are working on. I'm trying to understand uh, that those connections between these places. And uh, it's very, it, it could very much be related to environmental factors, though I'm not I've never heard specifically that being argued. Mm. Okay, thank you. There's another question. How were the island's topography layouts and so on mapped? Were, were drones used? So at times drones are used uh, to collect the, the LIDAR data sets. Um, for my work in Samoa, it's fixed wing planes. Um, so this is freely available data. So anybody can have access to this data. This data was collected by NOAA. Uh, so 
Um, I got access to it pretty early because I, I was part of the group that delivered um, these products from the people that flew it to NOAA and the National Park Service in American Samoa, but these are freely available on the web. Um, we've been using drone-based LIDAR uh, here in Hawaii to, to get uh, some of these maps created as well. Um, it can be difficult. It just depends on the environment within which you're working. You can collect a lot more uh, precise data uh, if, you're, if you're working with drone-based LIDAR data just because you can hover. And the more you can hover, the more uh, laser pulses that can go down and hit that, uh, that uh, bare earth surface. Uh, and so you get a lot better image, a lot more precise image uh, of what that bare earth surface looks like. And so drones have been used quite a lot in Mesoamerica, uh, mm. where you get really high resolution data relative to fixed wing planes. Thank you. How are rising sea levels affecting environmental construction? That's a good, good question. Um, to some extent, that goes outside of my area of expertise, so I don't want to reach too much to that. Um, but from what I can tell, it's, uh, a lot of it has to do with, with trying to retain uh, coastlines. So a lot of construction goes back to um, trying to retain those coastal habitats. Um, that, that I think most of us, uh, our cultural meanings, privilege, and, and things of that nature. So I think we can use some of the techniques that we see archaeologically, but this is probably one area, so thinking about construction of coastlines, um, where we don't have as much evidence from the archaeological record because um, we don't have, have that kind of dynamic change in the environment occurring in the past. So what happens in the mid Holocene is you actually have a drop in sea level. Mm -hmm. So what people responded to in the mid Holocene and especially between about a 1000 and 3000 years ago in the Pacific is actually a one to two meter drop in sea level that made coastlines prograde, made coastlines expand rather than retract. So instead of retracting and resulting in, in uh, narrower coastlines, they have more coastal space to work with, but that also resulted in reductions in, in marine space that re re resulted in reductions in the area of shallow marine habitats, which is probably one of the things that led to expansions in these interior environments. One of the things I didn't talk about too much in this talk is the timing of when we start to see some of the, this construction occur. In Samoa, we see this timing occur, uh, starting to occur about 1500 years ago. And that corresponds to these changes that we see naturally within the coastline uh, or along the coastline, the coastal habitats. There's another question here. Uh, what was the most interesting thing that you found through archaeological findings when seeing the many connections throughout Samoa and Hawaii in regards to the many adaptations of land? I think the most interesting thing I've found, I think the most interesting thing that anybody's really found uh, within the last 10, 15 years is just the extent to which these islands were modified. Uh, as I, If you go look back at population estimates from say the 70s or even 80s, uh, they're tiny compared to the population estimates that we make today. So the population estimates of how many people lived in Hawaii is, is on the upper end. Most archeologists think that uh, it's on the, the near the upper end. So you often hear of estimates of 800,000 to a million people that lived in the Hawaiian archipelago that's really, really hard to test whether that's accurate or not, because we just, we, we have a lot of the areas of where people used to plant food, but we don't have the remains of where people were living. So it's really important to look at where people were living, how many houses are represented at different periods of time. That's where you get the best demographic estimates. But in any case, it's a lot bigger than what we thought it was. That's the case in Samoa as well. As I mentioned before, one of the things that's really struck me is how much more extensive, spatially extensive land use was in the past compared to how it is today. And how much more intensive land use was in the past 
compared to what it is today as well in some areas, not in all areas, but in some areas. And so I think it speaks to a lot of opportunities on these islands, a lot of opportunities to expand the agricultural sector and expand agricultural sectors using techniques that have been practiced in these places for, in some cases, thousands of years. One more question, Seth, or at least one that I see and other comments coming up, or two more. Um, one is, thank you for a very informative presentation. Have you studied historical agricultural practices in low-lying atolls? If so, are the techniques that would be applicable now that would help communities and atolls be more resilient to climate change? Yeah, so I haven't uh, directly studied any atolls. I've done some work in Tokelau, uh, but that wasn't related to agriculture. It's more related to settlement more generally. Um, but but a number of people have. A number, uh, I think the agroforestry, as I've talked about, is seen as really important in Antal environments where you have really small spatial areas um, and often pretty dense populations as a, a method to uh, combat um, some of the the issues that that have come up recently to especially the stabilized coastlines and things like that but uh for centuries people have practiced forms of pit agriculture mm -hmm. um so we have really early examples of pit agriculture actually in even non-atoll environments so in tonga uh, there's forms of pit agriculture that are associated with the earliest settlement period a period in micronesia we have pit uh pit agriculture agricultural infrastructure associated with these early settlement periods as well. And what pit agriculture does is, um, as the name suggests, you dig a pit uh, and tap into the freshwater lens. And I, I often think of atolls as uh, just like other small islands as the most constructed in the Pacific because people have to create soil in atolls. People are creating cultivatable soil on atolls by, uh, by means of um, composting. So they're putting in a lot of organic leaves or other organic refuse, their, their own waste to, to create a kind of soil that's conducive to actual uh, cultivation. So I see the expansion of pit cultivation where it's not practiced. The, the expansion of pit cultivation would be uh, quite useful today um, though, there's some questions about how that's going to be impacted by rising sea levels, which I think is a concern to everybody. Um, and uh, certainly agroforestry is a, a really important component of it too. So in, in Kiribati, you know, that's called bye-bye. And one of the concerns with bye-bye constructions is that there is an increasing um, uh, salination of the freshwater table. Uh, and so that's affected the ability to produce. I have one more question. Um, in, in Hawaii, was there inland infrastructure that was focused on, agri on that wasn't focused on agroforestry, but influenced the relationship between native ecosystems and productive landscapes? Oh, certainly. Uh, and actually, the embankments that I, I showed today were, were not associated with agroforestry. Agroforestry uh, was uh, somewhat of a separate uh, kind of, of um, agricultural technique in, in several areas. So much of the field systems that we find uh, in leeward zones, say on the Big Island and on Maui, are geared towards the intensive production of sweet potato. And so what those embankments are for is to increase soil moisture to such an extent that people can intensively grow sweet potato in those locations. And these are, as I mentioned, really big landscapes. They're the leeward Kohala, which is the best studied, is an agricultural landscape that spans for some uh, 60 square kilometers. It's much of its ranch land today. So instead of uh, planting sweet potato and other crops, it's being utilized for, for cow husbandry. Um, Ka'u and uh, Kona are, are even larger field systems, again, utilized for uh, the, the cultivation of dryland crops, things like sweet potato, dryland taro, and other things of that nature. 
Um, these are very much, they're, they're very similar to the example that I showed with Ta'u, uh, these field systems that we have in uh, Leeward, Hawaii Island and uh, Maui are match on or uh, map on to uh, sweet spots, sweet spots in soil fertility. So sweet spots where elevation and temperature is just right, precipitation is just right, and the age of the underlying substrate is just right. There's some really incredible research that has been done over the last 20 years in Hawaii to map out those soil dynamics and that those correlations between intensively cultivated spaces, uh, often the cultivation of sweet potato, and those, those soil fertility sweet spots. One final comment, uh, saying mahalo for all the amazing, amazing content you have shared. I was able to learn a lot that I did not know. Um, I think we'll, we'll close the session, but before I do that, I want to thank a couple of people. First, uh, my colleague, uh, McKenna Kaufman uh, from the Institute of Sustainability and Resilience, uh, who co-hosts uh, this uh, series with me. And also our colleagues, Ida Arik, who is behind the Zoom and the technical knowledge that somebody like me doesn't know. Uh, and also uh, James Viennes from the Center for Pacific Island Studies. And on behalf of CIPRIS and ISR, I'd like to thank you again, uh, um, uh, Seth, for giving up your time to give this wonderful and very informative talk. Again, thank you. Thank you and mahalo so much from us. Thank you.